Buddy, I remember I had just started stand up. I, I was carrying my VHS tape to to this. I would just say, I had, You're real? I, Did you have your, your headshot with it too? Oh, yeah. What oh, was yeah. your headshot? Yeah, Can yeah, you describe it? Envelope. It was the most embarrassing headshot. <laughs> I, looked like a, I looked like a Persian wannabe Italian mafia. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Wild Truth. This is a fun one of a very special guest, a guest that I've been really looking forward to sitting down with. He's the OG. He is definitely a part of history in stand-up comedy, and his records have been outstanding. Everybody knows, but I'm excited because I'm going to connect from a whole another place and let's dive into it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dane Cook. I love watching you do that, man. It was <laughs> <laughs> the pro that I always knew you could be, man. Oh, and look buddy. at you now, man. It's so great to see you. It's so great to be here. And uh, I was beyond thrilled when you said you wanted to sit down with me and do what we're doing. Of course, I'm beyond thrilled. And and Dane, I got to say, you've done so many podcasts. You sit down with all these amazing comedians. Sure. You, you've talked about comedy. You've talked about your career. And, and today, in order to have your fans be able to see maybe a different conversation. Yep. I thought we'll dive into some okay. history of, 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 you know, friendships, a lot of the emotions that we, we carry to the comedy clubs, you know, from here to yeah. there, just, just those amazing moments. Yeah, we don't get a don't, chance to share. People don't always get to see the moments that, uh, we ingratiate and, and, support each other. Yeah. Sometimes a career is off kilter. Sometimes we feel very lost. Sometimes we're having the time of our life, but nobody seems to know or care. Yep. That's always a, yep. a tough one. Yep. I'm on a streak and people are like, I'm trying to figure it out. But whenever we cross paths, there's always been a real simpatico with you and I. And it's something mm -hmm. I, I, I know we can talk about one thing in particular, if you bring it up, but like we, we, we share affinity for the people we love. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. share, uh, I think a, a boundless enthusiasm for the stage. You're one of the best comics I've ever seen present on Thank stage in my you. 32 years you, you when you are on one it's a it's a sight to see man and uh, it's uh it's a real uh it's i don't use this word often uh i'm not the most religious but i have faith but it's it's a blessing to know you the way that i do so Oh, you know, buddy, let's, let's thank chop you it out, so man. much. Yeah. So, this is where uh, you hit me with the uh, fucked up hard question. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> you were beat up in sixth grade, bloody to a pulp, Dane. Talk about it. Dane, I got it. I'm going to tell you something. Okay. And this is not an exaggeration. Okay. Of all comics ever in my career, you're the one I've learned the most from. Mm. I've learned more from you, from watching you, from asking you questions, from hanging out with you than I've ever learned from any comics. <laughs> so this episode for me is to create those moments, uh, again, certain conversations so yeah. other people can also be inspired by the oh, things great. I've been inspired oh, by. Oh man, cool. Well, a lot of what I share with you is probably things people, you know, brought to me and yeah, helped me through yeah. some, some spots. Buddy, I remember I had just started stand up. <clears throat> I, I was carrying my VHS tape to, to this, I would just say, I had, You're real? I, I had five or six ah. of those VHS tapes in the trunk of my car. Yes. I would show up and would hand it to bookers. Yeah. And, uh, did you have your, your headshot with it too? Oh yeah. What oh, was yeah. your headshot? Yeah, Can yeah, you describe it? Envelope. It was the most embarrassing headshot. <laughs> I looked like a, I looked like a Persian wannabe Italian, uh, mafia dude, you know, <laughs> shirt open, yeah. ha hair uncut, terrible. Yeah, um, mine was a mullet, and I'm actually doing this, <laughs> and I'm bowing in a vest. I look like a genie. I remember that. A yeah. frat boy genie is what I look like. <laughs> I think you posted it um, when there was a there was a little um, thing going on Instagram. Everybody yeah. was posting their old headshots. Oh, oh, yeah, I think that's I when I saw that. I did. I know it's nice and embarrassing. The good kind of embarrassing. Oh my god! What was the name of the club on Sunset? Uh, Jay Davis used to do the show. Uh, a Dublin's. Dublin's. Yeah. So I used to show up there every. Tuesday, watch you at Dublin's. Mm. And oh my God, you would put on a show. And this is like Dane, like at its best, but the world hadn't hadn't discovered yet. Right. And the buzz was already out. Yeah, a little underground. Some it, colleges everybody knew. Everybody knew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It but was fun. It, 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 but the world hadn't yes. like giving you the ticket to just take off, right? It was a beautiful time because what you recall in that time is that it's really all love because nobody, there's no haters because they don't know you. 
it's all love for a good so period true. of time. And I think we so experienced true. that at Dublin. So true. Yeah. Alonzo Bowden would go after you. The only and, person and, who would follow and, me. The only one who, who would, would crush. Have. Yeah, it was so great. <laughs> yeah. And and I would I would be there just just a student watching you and, and taking this in. And and I think every comic at that time wanted to be Dane Cook. Wow. Everybody was just watching you and and that is what stand-up comedy is at, at that time. Like, so yeah. everyone was watching you and you were so physical. You were so big. You were bigger than life. Right. You were huge. And and, and yeah. I remember that room, the ceiling was maybe short like here, but yeah. you were just I massive. I think I jumped up and hit it with my head a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I it remember. Was, it was almost like performing for your life is w the way I described it, especially in there because you know you have the goods. Uh, you don't know how long you're going to zeitgeist. That's unpredictable in a career, but I knew in that moment I was not only having the time of my life, but I was I was learning a lot about stand up mm. because of the uh, position I was in in L.A. I was getting a lot of stage time because I was getting the buzz and the he might he's teed up mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. we should let him in perform more like uh, but to be in that room and to share that time with you guys I felt like I was capitalizing on all the love that I had in me for stand up with the understanding that sometimes a, uh, sometimes you don't get everything you want. But in that moment, I was, and I you wasn't going to let it away. Hundred percent. And and I think you know your your confidence has always been a, a, a remarkable part of you. You 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 walk on stage differently than most comedians I've known. You walk on with such confidence, presence, coolness. There's a cool factor, and and you you grab that microphone. And it feels like th these are the moments that maybe a lot of people don't see, but as a comedian, I, I observe. We could, I, I, right. and I go because we're together look before, at, and we yeah. saw. Yeah, look at that walk. Look, look at that presence. Look at that. You, you grab that microphone. You look this audience in the eyes, and when your voice like hits that microphone, the audience is instantaneously in the palm of your hands. They're with you. Right. They're they're rooting for you. So you, you, you know, one thing I'm just I just want to hear is maybe. Back in the days when those Dublin's, you know, shows you would you would show up and all the comics, everybody knew you knew you're the best. You knew at that time. I mean, you had that air that I am, I am the groundbreaking new biggest voice of comedy right now. Well, I knew I was coming up with a generation of new comedy fans because I'd been out on the road enough at college just w hearing, this is my first comedy show. So you're like, oh, they're, th I'm leading this charge with the new generation. <laughs> but it was also like. Going into, say, Dublin's, for example, was the understanding of, man, I, I kind of feel like I want to emulate the best. I, I knew who I, my personal best were. And if I'm going to share even a fraction of the my career in that space, mm -hmm. I want to make them proud of me as well. So not only did I want to make the audience think, ah, oh, this guy's got the mic and the prowess, the prowess. Like, I walk up there with the prowess. I don't want you to think I don't got it. I got it. But that was also in the hopes that the people that I love, my heroes, would identify that and give me the pat on the back. And you know where that all came from? If you don't mind me sharing a story, I love talking Please. about my mom from time to time. My mom was um, a deeply insecure young woman who became the most unbelievable mom. And I saw so much uh, power and strength in her. I was also an insecure introvert. But what I learned from my mom thankfully, is um, when she was single, my parents separated in junior high school. My mom would, uh, sometimes she would, uh, sometimes she would kind of take herself down a few pegs, like negative talk about herself. Mm -hmm. And yet when she got gussied up and she would go to a place that was called the Vogue, it was where all the people at that time would go and dance. And my mom loved dancing, beautiful long legs. And just my mom had a great uh, energy about her. But dancing was her thing. As she would get herself together, to walk out the door for her date night, she would look beautiful. She didn't look insecure. She didn't say all those mm -hmm. things that she said hours earlier. And she said, I say, I'm going to go and have the night of my life. And she had the swagger. And then when she got home, I'd say, how was your night? And she could say to me, all the guys wanted to dance with me. Oh, mm -hmm. oh it gets me emotional, man. Cause it mm -hmm. gave me everything I needed in that moment to go. I'm both people. I'm sometimes very fragile and vulnerable, mm. but I'm also a person who can entertain thousands of people. And when I'm on, I'll share it. Yeah. 
If you weren't, you wouldn't be a great comedian. Thank you. Th this whole sensitive part of, of an artist makes them so special. I mean, that's, that's maybe, maybe the, the, the best part yeah, is being yeah, able to see somebody's yeah. true, and the also, true self the, the, shown. The challenges you go through with your insecurity. Yeah. Because that's how you relate to the audience members. That's yeah. how you relate to, to people because you, you've been there and you've, you've been challenged and you've overcome right. certain insecurities. Right. So you like, ah, I know, I know where you are. I can help right. you. And, here, yeah. and then you just you know, describe that scenario. So funny. But when you're on stage too, and I, you know, you, you, I, I watch you a lot and it's like, you're taking the audience on a ride and you're discovering the ride oftentimes in real time <laughs> as they are. And I watch you and I, I think that you identify, I like to do that. I like to, and you like to weave the act into the life. So yes. it kind of is like, we'll go where we need to go. And then if I have a bit about boxing and that guy looks like he might box, you'll say, you look like kind of a big guy. You'll talk to him. You'll get some real time laughs. Yeah. And then you say, do you do any boxing? <laughs> Even if he goes, never, you'd be like, and then you're in your bit about boxing <laughs> and nobody sees when Max puts yeah, the yeah. line in there. It's yeah. really, really tremendous. And yeah. I've always tried to do that, yeah. but, but it's not just that you're very good at finagling your way in and out of a bit. It's the fact that you're okay with the unknown. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you, you're confident mm -hmm. enough in yourself. And I had to be at that time confident enough in myself to go, got the goods. I'm feeling good. The audience is rooting for you from the moment you get up there. You never forget that. Young comics, I tell them, just remember this. They didn't load in and pay a ticket price to go, hope everybody fails tonight. Yeah. They're rooting they, for you. Now, if you, you give them a reason that. to go the other way, hmm. their own insecurity of watching you fail might make them feel like, now I have to attack you because I don't like how I feel in this moment. And also I'm identifying failure mm -hmm. and I don't want to feel like a failure. So they're either with you or they're against you. Yeah, yeah. They're with you though. You know, something... Uh, pops into my head. <clears throat> if there was no social media, especially the way it is now, yeah. back in the, the Dublin's times, sure. and you were doing some on the spot, off the fuck, crazy stuff with the audience. Yeah. And if there was a freaking social media then, oh my God. God, your videos would have been insanely viral. <laughs> right. Yeah, I yeah, I do I think about you, that. Sometimes. I remember you were doing this thing. It, I saw a couple of times it came up, a fan, a, a dude that was just like testosterone oozing out of his ears, yeah. just going crazy. He would just stand up and 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 the, the, somehow the conversation would get into like, I'm going to punch you in the face. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, punch me. I'll take a punch from you, yep. Dane. And you're like, I'm going to punch you. Yeah, yeah, and then the whole audience, I mean, you would just do these crazy. Right freaking moments now where like you'd be arrested sued the video would get oh out oh my god people would misconstrue it and say you're abusive and, <laughs> but back then it was really like hey anything to feel like i'm in a, a lane of my own that was the other thing too oh, yeah you, you created know? a different world yeah man it felt it felt it it felt like and, and i still feel it because of the the wave of goodwill even though the the purity of being the new shiny thing and when it becomes a little more par for the course and life gets in the way that that love of what you have with that audience and hopefully more audience that comes in that you cement that once yeah. you have a breakthrough moment in your life or career and you know what you're capable of you're never not capable of that again yeah yes yeah, true and that stays with you but, through but all you, the next success but you also have a really good instinct like you know how to be um you know how to be uh, edgy it's not even edgy you know how to you know how to create um and excitement. You know how to make people just literally like yeah. their heads explode. You, well, you know, know that naturally. But, but one of the, let's talk about little secrets of the sauce is like, mm. one thing I learned very early on for me is the best comedy comes from some uncomfortable or some tension mm. or something off kilter. So I create those moments. Yeah. So sometimes when I say, um, you know, uh, this guy over here, listen, man, I'm going to stop the show. Okay. I'm sorry, everybody. But in, in seriousness, I'm here to fucking entertain these and you create that moment because then the elastic <laughs> yeah. and then they see like, oh, he's in a good mood again. He's affable. And so it's the juxtaposition. Yeah. It's life. You make life happen right there in life. It's not just a funny act all the way through in life. It's like commentary on myself, self-deprecating. Sometimes I'm the shit. Sometimes I feel like shit. When we can go up and swirl all that in there, I think that's when we're at our best. Yeah. It's the conducting of the comedy. Yeah. You literally are the conductor it of is. the emotion in that room. It is. It's it's a, it's a beautiful thing when it works, and when it's not working, 
it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. the comic before you. <laughs> it's not the crowd or the air conditioning not working. It's like, what am I doing wrong? What yeah, am I? Yeah. How am I not connecting? Dude, continuing on this, I remember yeah. there was a moment you did the, um, you did a talk show. I don't know if it was Jimmy Kimmel or who it was, and you, you, you guys, you, you got on the fucking desk. You slapped him. You did this huge fucking act. I don't know if he slapped you or you slapped him. Right. It was just like. It hadn't been done. Right, Every right. comic was just going on the show, sitting on the chair, telling a couple funny stories and leaving. Here goes Dane Cook. That's why you were constantly making everybody go, what Like the how world? and why, yeah. It was because growing up watching late night uh, talk shows, th the limits they could take it to, you'd be like, they stood up, they poured Johnny Carson's, you know, water on their head they, and you'd you go, that's what they used to be able to do. That was the furthest you could take decorum. Okay. And it was like, all right, so if I'm here on Kimmel, now I could take it further. We can, I can be more, the antics. Yes. It's like, how can I put some of the antics in there to make somebody at home go, I've never seen this before. Wow. So, so since up to now, I've not seen it. I haven't seen any other comic go I'm trying on to think and if do. There, nobody that's like uh, a whirling no. dervish up there that no. kind of takes over. No, no one's jumped on their desk. No one's yeah. slapped. But they would tell me to take no over. Does. Kimmel, yeah. you know, really uh, a lot of props to him because he helped put me on the map on late night because he would say to me, um, you know, like Leno and these other guys or even Letterman, they really wanted you to come out there with a well-conditioned routine and, mm -hmm. and they're, they're joke smiths and masters and monologue masters. But Kimmel had just a whole thing, which was come take over. When wow. you get out there, take over. Do you want me wow. to tee you up for something? Take the show from me. It's wow. funnier if I'm like just laughing at... The fact that you pulled the show out of my hands and nobody else had allowed me to do that. So it was, it was cool. It was a great it's a lot of courage five or six end. years. It, it, it shows his integrity and ability to go. I think the audience in America likes when he comes on and he's unpredictable. So they had me and, on a and lot. And do you know how you would prepare for those moments? Like, how, like how did you get inspired to go, Ooh, I'm going to do, I'm going to push it this far. And this is how. Yeah. Some of it was just on stuff I'd been working on at the club and I could kind of see, you know, okay, based on how I interacted okay. with the audience member and some of it, well, honestly, like I would really prepare for Kimmel. Like mm -hmm. I wanted to know at least a couple of weeks in advance, not a last minute booking. Cause I was like, I want to come up with something that, uh, I actually remember at one point coming up with like, a, I call it a stunt. It wasn't a stunt like a jackass or a Steve-O, but like the way I would stunt it was sometimes I'd say like, um, to Jimmy, you know how they do like the ad for the show and they'll cut a few commercials and they'll say, later on tonight, we got uh, Pearl Jam and Dane, Dane Cook is here. And you'd, you'd be like, hey, I'd be like, let's do something in that moment that looks like something really crazy happened on the show. So I'd grab him by the neck and I'd say, I just poisoned you. And they'd use that for the teaser after the news. And then we talk about how we got everybody to watch because I didn't poison them. And I just said that for the, so we would do stunts and things like that, man. That's it was a blast. Cool. That was a, I was a young, cocky, brash student of comedy who was suddenly becoming in my own. And I was reveling in it, Max. And you know, I'd come into okay. the club reveling. I, I, reveling. I, love, I love what you said. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Who were you, who was able to whisper in Dane's cook at that time? Who did you listen to? You, you, you know, you, you had a, a, a massive career, so yeah. much attention. Like people from the, from the public eye, maybe people would know. Cause uh, I no, had some mentors from Family, Boston. a manager, yeah. best friend. Like who was the person that you would go in the middle of this, all of this pressure and care. And I know a lot of it. Who was the most trustworthy ear for you or, or yeah. someone to I mean, to at the time I still was so super close with the guys that I was in my graduating class before people have families and unfortunately everybody kind of, but in that time we were real road dogs, okay. you know, coming up with Bill Burr, coming up with Robert Kelly, coming up with Gary Gullman, coming up with Al Del Benny. And these are guys that I knew since we were kids uh, and we all were rooting for each other. And mm -hmm. so to be able to, in those moments, go to them and not only have them be like, dude, you crushed it and all the, you know, like you killed the last I saw the show. Uh, but then to have like, you know, them be pinpoint on like, you know, you've been doing lately, which is really interesting is you're sharing more stuff about like, uh, the crying bit. I remember when somebody's like, do you do the crying bit, which was on vicious circle? Like how'd that come to, to be? Because you're not just sticking with the parts that are funny physically, but then you say the line. And I remember if it was Burr or who's a, somebody's like, then you say the line, like, you know, I call my dad and my dad's like, uh, I served in Korea. What do you like? And suddenly I'm making it personal and silly, absurd, but grounded. And somebody, one of those road dog guys had come to me and it was like from my graduating class before maybe mentors and people that were my heroes, I can share some of those, but it was all of us kind of hitting each other up. 
and never taking away from each other. We never took away from each other. If you had a bad set on TV or somebody was like, oh, I went to a, it was like, but what went right? And how can you build off of that? So I was lucky, man. My graduating class is, you know, people know their names. There are a lot of successful you know what, those people are, there. Those are good guys. Those yeah. are good comics. Those are comics straight up that I would say they have this one great quality, and that is they're not jealous. They're 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 really supportive. Right, right. Real go getters. You know, guys that they already know they have something. They don't need to be jealous True. of someone else's career. They're like, hey, this is me, this is my voice, yeah. this is my little aura. And we all wanted it. Yeah. And even though I essentially broke out early, probably because of my savvy with the internet mm. and like being on that, but they were just so stoked for me. And it was kind of cool because then we could be on each other's rides. And then when they started to arrive, you know, like when Burr hosted Saturday Night Live, you know, I didn't get to talk to him immediately, but like four months later, I called him up. And I think I just said something like, you know, you think anybody was going, you, you killed, you crossed, or you did this or that. Or I just said, um, walking down that hallway by yourself in the middle of the night, right? With Dan Aykroyd and Belushi and, and knowing like you're a part of it. And just to share that with him, to be like, mm. you did it, man. You did it. You know, mm. that's a beautiful thing. Cause only they know those guys, how hard it was for all of us, but especially like what I went through, you know, especially when my parents got sick mm -hmm. and stuff like mm -hmm. to have them be there at that moment, Max, it's like, um, you know, that I love them forever. It doesn't matter where people go or how you yeah. grow together or apart, you know, those guys in that time in my life. Yeah. The best memories. Yeah. yeah because, the because the stakes were so high, the yeah. emotions were running, you're under so much pressure. And these are the people that are good to you. I mean, those yeah. memories are so precious. Yeah. And just the laughs through everything. And you know, things have changed, Dane. Those relationships are the, the, this generation, <clears throat> the fast pace of internet and the social media, you don't, we don't get to spend the same amount of time we used to. There was a right. lot of quality time that comics spent together. Now they yeah. spend more time maybe on social media, liking each other or stuff or commenting. Right. There's a lot that. of cross pollinating and it's very entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. but you're not sitting in a car really yeah. getting to know three strangers that you're on the exactly. same gig track together going like, there's no phones and it's just a uh, talk and shop. Mm -hmm. you know, and getting to know each other, you know, really and you and I, we would do that a lot. We'd yeah. sit in that lobby yeah. and yeah. some, you know, what I love about, you know, we've had relationships, a lot of us at the Laugh Factory in particular, but all over town, you know, the store and the factory and the improv, but coming in some nights and, you know, if you're wearing an emotion, you know, what's going on, man? Yeah. What's up? Yeah. You know, yeah. ah, man, I'm not where I want to be at. You know, I think the worst thing to feel, and I, I, I don't know, like what your kind of, um, mechanics are to go through it is like when you know your when you know you're ready to, um, to, to be on the court, but you feel like you're on the bench, mm. Mm. you know, that's the hardest thing because we have so much to share and we want to share. And so those nights when we would come in and be like, yeah, I'm here and I'm doing it, but I kind of feel a little lost. And we'd yeah. sit in that lobby, yeah. bust yeah. chops, yeah. bust balls, yeah. talk each other all the way up, maybe so a little true. bit down just for so the sake true. of being like, wow, wow. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like a little therapy room it's in the there. the best, man. It's the best. And it's, it's a classroom too. Yeah. It's yeah, a yeah. classroom. It, 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 it's, and it's a charmed life. We don't even have that anymore. It not, no, you because, know? because people are not only coming and going, but people are TikToking and making their yep. YouTube videos. Yep. And it, it, but I love seeing it entrepreneurial and I like seeing the cross pollination because I came up at a time when unfortunately I broke out and then not a lot of comics wanted to really help me. my class and even the class ahead. I'm talking like the Marins and stuff. Mm -hmm. They just weren't, it wasn't conducive to go, Hey, you know, some stuff. I know some stuff. If we come together, we can build our audiences together. And I was always looking for that way to like, you know, to build out and cross pollinate. It's a word yeah, I use all yeah, the time. Yeah. I talk to comics all the time. Cross pollinate. Yeah. Be in each other's camps. Talk to each so other. So smart. Up. Yeah, man. So, we have to. So yeah. so logical also. You know, why yeah. not? It doesn't make sense. You know, and, and because there's nowadays, a lot of jealousy and there's a lot of competitiveness oof, in this business, yeah, man. It's yeah, it's yeah. real dog eat dog sometimes, you know? Well, the jealousy is the number one worst quality in the entertainment. Anywhere in the world. But I, I in in our business. Yeah. You know, we see a lot of comics hating on comics when their when their career is getting yeah. amazing, or maybe singers are the same way, maybe actors. I don't know, but but I think um, you know we see it. We've seen it so much. I mean, you've gone through so much of that, um, and it's and it, and and I think part of it has to do with your t you were this. It was not just a comedy act. It wasn't just you were just telling very funny 
jokes. It was your persona. It was this. Oh, it was a movement. Guy that it was really a movement. Yeah, it was a comedy event. Dude, you were that the was com- you were the, you were the first rock star of stand up, and and you were the dude who was so good looking would show up to the club, girls wall to wall screaming. And you just, you had a whole persona. I mean, yeah. to this day, you have this thing of, it's Dane, Dane walking in and there's, there is an energy about you. Right. And, and I think that's what brought a lot of jealousy your way. Right. A lot of the comics were just like, oh, stand up is this or stand up is that, or just trying to find a reason to hate. Right. Stand up at that time was supposed to be. Uh, very dingy, skulking around a lot of like you're not you don't meet Self, and greet. self-deprecating. You don't you don't uh, share a link and say like I got some merch and like all that stuff was supposed to be like if you sold it like real like low key. So wow. I was certainly playing into the wow. I was playing into the the business, the show business. I understood the business as early on as the show. Fortunately, on the other side, I had a great mom, but my dad was very business minded, and he put things in my mind where it's like. You're not just doing a funny comedy show. You got to keep in touch with these people. You got to let them know when you're back in town. You have to let them know that you're interested in meeting their friends and hopefully they'll come in. My dad was the person who said, play a, play a lot of colleges. And I was like, what do you know about this career? Why do I have to play a lot of colleges? But he was brilliant enough to say, because the things that you discover in your college years, you'll hold on to for the rest of your life. So if you build up enough of those college crowds that love you for the rest of your life, you might always have the rent paid or an audience to play in front of. Genius, brilliant. Wow. I implement, I got goosebumps. I implemented that immediately into I my, love into my that. life. Yeah. So that's what I was getting at when I said, well, wh- who was the wise Yeah. So those guys, person in your life? But then when I sort of arrived, man, it was like a, a lot, you know, you're passing by an, an Eddie Murphy moment with his hand on my shoulder and sharing some, you know, some behind the scenes, you know, mm-hmm. confidence or, you know, Steve Martin, come to lunch with me. Here's my book. Wow. I, he wrote something so beautiful in his book, which basically was like, scratch out my name and put your name in. It's our story. That's what he said when he, you know, wrote his book, Born Standing Up. Um, the Richard Lewis, who I'm still very close with, and I talk to Richard all the time. Actually, I think I'm going to do his podcast hopefully very soon. He just hit me up okay, about it. Cool. Um, the people that had been further down the road, they don't want anything from you. They don't expect anything from you. They just love that they can share their success and their failure mm-hmm. failure mm-hmm. with you. So 32 years in now, like as the old bull on the hill, um, who still can, you know, compete with some of the young bulls, half court, not full court yeah. hoops. <laughs> but now I get to do that. And and, and I, my whole goal with that is like what a lot of those mentors did for me, which is like, keep your fucking integrity. Keep your integrity. And if your integrity is like, I, I'm willy nilly and I'm supposed to be like the pirate in this thing, do it. Don't let him or her tell you change for the room. And that's what I've really taken from most of the people that I wanted to emulate and that I've had a great chance to I mean, these meet are know. massive names. Oh yeah. Some of the, you know, the Jerry Lewis who became God. like my dad, Jerry, for the last seven years of his life, you know, Jerry Lewis would call me on Sundays, Jerry Lewis, my the goodness. greatest comedy star bigger than Bieber in the world. They own the fifties to the sixties, him and Dean Martin. And then he was entrepreneurial. He invented, he was a inventor. He invented uh, playback. When you see playback on a movie, Jerry Lewis made that. That's wow. his innovation, you know, uh, directing, writing, producing highs, lows. So when I got to know somebody like a Jerry Lewis who took me under his wing and really was like, Hey, I want to, I want to, I want to help you to figure out how to sustain. There's no tricks. There's no, you know this person. It's like, you don't want to, you want to sustain, grow with your audience and tell them when you messed up. And when you're doing well, share that too. Share the information with others on that. Hey, here's how I got here. And so I try to be a mentor like that. Keep your integrity. I'll tell you how to be funny, but I will tell you how to protect your business and how you, how you protect your legalese business and, and your, your pride. You know, we all have to, fa- your failure is important to your success. Mm-hmm. Your mm-hmm. failure is a critical stop on your road to success. So if you're trying to be like, you should do this, and I prevent you from the things that you should fail at to be a better self-actualizer, yeah. I'm doing yeah. you a disservice. I mean, look, a hundred percent. Uh, and Dane, your your life, forget about career, <clears throat> your life has been a a, a tremendous, uh, humbling, uh, self-finding. I mean, I don't know if I believe in re- uh, re- coming back and yeah. re- re- <laughs> reincarnation. Reincarnation. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I believe in reincarnation in the sense of like, uh, definitely we're coming back or not. I don't know. Right. But if it's true, this lifetime you lived, I mean, oh my God, 
the the highs and lows. Yeah. I was like, okay, guys, this one's for oh me. My God. <laughs> I mean, really, but not without its low lows, man. Can't enjoy the high highs unless you, you know. can you share a little bit about the humbling experiences where you thought, God, this sucks right now, yeah. but I think this is changing me as a human. And, and for yeah. that, I'm grateful. Yeah. There, well, I appreciate that. And I, to speak to that, you know, I, I have to preface it with this, like, there's no real woe is me because as long as I've always had an audience, I felt purpose. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even if it's uh you're out of vogue or whatever they call that out of fashion for a little bit, or you're in or now you dip out. As long as I walk into a club and I feel like there's a crowd there that wants to laugh and I can get them laughing, like I'm grateful. Right. So the woe is me moments probably were feeling like, I remember after I did vicious circle at HBO, Chris Rock called me. It was one of the first phone calls. And I was like, I want to be really honest about this. I was like blown away that Chris Rock just called me. I wasn't like Chris. Yeah. I was really like, you liked it, dude, man. Thank you. And he just hit, said some really beautiful words to me on that call. And I was really like, oh my goodness, man. Like one of my favorites and a guy that used to bump me at the comedy cellar every night, uh, you know, <laughs> deservedly so, um, called me. But then where I was so disheartened was, um, there was a regime change at the, at HBO and the new people came in and they were like, we don't get you. I was, I never forget this call. Yeah. We, you know, we, we, you're a good guy, Dane, but we don't get you. I couldn't believe what I heard. I was on top of the world. I was still like, kind of like up around the peak. It wasn't like I was coming down the career, like chill moment. I said, you don't like what? And in my head, I'm like, Chris Rock called me. He gets me and it. And my career at HBO is over. You know, oh I had done Torgasm for them, successfully uh, documented comedy, and then I did Vicious Circle. And to be honest, Max, I don't think I've ever expressed this, but I, I thought I wanted to get to HBO. And I thought I made it. And now, like a Carlin, I'm going to just every few years put out an HBO special. Mm. And I don't care whatever, whatever else happens, it's all incoming call and great. I'll explore it. But that's all I wanted to be an HBO comic and to be on their roster. And to make him proud, special, and to then be able to chronicle my life in comedy by going, oh, my third special, I'm now I'm like changing, I'm adding this, or now I've grown up in this way, or sharing something, or, and when they called and said, we don't get you, it was like the wind went out of my sails, and that that was a hard era. I entered into a very, I was a little lost, and when you're lost, sometimes the people that used to be there when you were had all mm -hmm. the answers, they dip out. You know, so mm -hmm. I was a little lost, a little lonely and mm -hmm. the realization of is I don't get everything that I want just because I worked hard to get here. I got to keep yeah. working hard. And, and that line is so, it, it's we don't get so you. hard. We, we just don't get you. And I really had to go, can you, I'm really, please, like I'm a storyteller. You know, I don't think on the call I was doing this, but it, I'm expressing mm -hmm. through my mm -hmm. team, like call them out, like I'm, I'm LPMs, laughs per minute. I'm telling jokes like, and I'm giving other examples of comic. I'm like. It, it's jokes hidden within the framework of the story, you know? Wow. So to have them say that was almost like I was, um, humbled and there was no Netflix and there was no nothing else really outside of HBO at that time. Really? It's like, you maybe show time or somebody else, but it didn't feel right. Um, so that was probably a, a time when I think I had to like do some soul searching and be like, where do I belong in the, in order to continue to put out. And then soon after you started doing all the big movies. You know, it was, it was after all of this, you yeah. started doing the big films. It was funny. Cause as, as I was losing my, f the faith of HBO, I was gaining the faith of Hollywood at that time. But I understood that the town looked at me. I had a meeting with a big wig once who said to me, um, and it was so not necessary. And I knew it was just like frosting on the, on their cake. They, they, they knew they were going to get some bang for their buck with me. I was smart enough to know the mechanics of Hollywood. So when they offered me a $15 million movie, I said, no, let me do the $4 million movie and I'll take a few more million. But if I, if I make double there, I win. But if I don't make the 15, I, mm. it's my fault. So I was, I was smart enough to be smart enough <laughs> in that moment. But I had this guy sit with me and kind of a big wig and he was like, oh, everybody at this table, we were just talking about you before you came in and you are the Tom Hanks of our generation. We're, we're, we are confident. And I was like, I know the movie I'm making with you. It's not a Tom Hanks level movie, but it is a, it is a fun movie, <laughs> yeah. but the bullshit detector in that uh -huh. moment. And then me realizing I'm just a, a piece of the machinery right now. Mm -hmm. I'm a product in their pipeline. 
make nice, but get what I can get out of it. Get the right exposure, use the PR machine that they're going to put together, send people to my website or my fucking my space or Facebook. But I understand I'm like, oh man, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm hot right now. I'm the flavor of the moment. And what I get out of it in success or not is indicative of how I behave now. Wow. Yeah. I'm not wow. the Tom. Hey, um, I didn't say, but it's like, oh, I'd like, I'd like to be the Dane Cook of all of it. And I don't need his career. And I don't, I'm not looking for that. Um, so it was like stark in that moment to be like, damn, they're, they're painting me up or trying to prime me up to get more of what they want. But I felt when I left that meeting a little underwhelmed because I was like, yeah, they don't get it. They don't know really where I want to take my life and my career. Yeah. Know? And they would never really. And, and that's interesting. Dane, you made some really bold choices with the movies, with yeah. the, with bunch of the gigs you, yeah. you took. I was, I was you lucky. Know? Good team. Yeah. Good team around me. And I was just going to get lucky. to that. How, how much of... Uh, like having a good team, how yeah. important is it? Well, you know, it, it's, you know, again, sometimes team members, same thing, like speaking, you know, right down to earth is like, sometimes people are on your team just cause you're, you're, you're cruising. It's easy to be on your team when you're already like got the incoming call business. Yep. But I'll tell you about like, I'm going to name a name right now. Like at a certain point with CA, incredible agency, I had the luxury of, um, you know, being friends with people from the top to some of the new people right in the door. And there was a guy on the come up at that time. His name is Jeremy Plager. It is Jeremy Plager. And, and Jeremy was a guy that maybe like even the people that were on my day in and day out, they didn't catch this one script that came through. And he's like, Hey, there's this movie called Mr. Brooks. Kevin Costner is starring in it. And it's just, it's a psychological thriller and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I put myself on tape for it. You know, this man took my tape and he literally got in his car, he drove to the client of CA, Kevin Costner, knocked on the door and said, you know Dane Cook? And he's like, yeah, he's funny. He wants to audition for this. This is definitely, you should watch this. Jeremy Plager gave me that opportunity. Wow. And, and what a freaking movie. And, and the movie and all that. But I just, just again, to pinpoint, like be understanding that the people that you meet on the way up, the people that you meet <laughs> leveled out, people that you meet on a slide, you be good to people and you start to realize mm. they're just as passionate about wanting to get to where they're interested in. And Jeremy Plager knew I was the right guy. Mm -hmm. And if he looked good, then maybe Jeremy Plager gets something from it. So I, I, to this day, my career is different because of Jeremy Plager, then Kevin Costner. But if he didn't do that, I would not have gotten that opportunity. And then to this day, I've gotten some cool stuff that's off kilter, dramatic, kind of caustic because Jeremy Plager got into a car and said, really, watch this. That movie gained a lot of respect for you. Like oh, everybody totally. Cha saw a my side life. of you, they're like, whoa. Yeah, no, to this day, I get a dramatic thing and they go, oh yeah, Mr. Brooks, man, that let us know that you could come out of the yeah. comedy character and yeah. you could do something re you know, right here. And so again- That was a good movie. Thanks, man. You murdered the role. Yeah. No pun intended. I was texting was with so Costner uh, three months ago. It was the 15 year anniversary. And we threw some really beautiful, I mean, that man is, he is a prolific, talk about like other people that mentor and not in comedy, but just what he meant to me through a time. My mom was very ill when I made that movie. Mm -hmm. Kevin was there for me. I was doing something in the never been done before business for me. Kevin was there for me. And then the chit chats in between setting up lights. And when he was like, he basically directed the movie, even though his name isn't on it, but to watch him work, to hear stories about the untouchables, to hear stories about dances with wolves, to hear stories about tin cup field of dreams. Mm -hmm. He met my dad. I got a beautiful picture of him and my dad together. My dad loved field baseball guy. Uh, Kevin Costner, like talk about like an adhesive in my life. So to be able to say to him, Hey, thank you for that opportunity. Uh, I, I'm not a person who likes to share. I know per podcast, it's always good to sh overshare. <laughs> so I'll share, I'll overshare with you. Cause you're Please. my friend a little, you know, he, he wrote me and was like, I couldn't have been as good as I was in that movie without what you gave me. Wow. And I owe a lot of like what, what I did in that movie. And, and it's really just like, I'll never not have that text because you can look at that when you're feeling again, like you're a little lost. You walk into the laugh factory. I don't know where I am or belong, but I can remember I did something good. And if I can remember I did that then and be acknowledged, I can do it again. Yeah. And how beautiful is it from these people in the positions they are, they make these you know, they reach out, they send these text messages because yeah, it's, it's also to learn from, right. For me and you to do that for other people. Oh man. That I, strangers. You know I'll hit people up. Yeah. I'll DM people all the time. And I'll just say, 
I'm watching your thing right now, and I just want to say you're exceptional, and I hope you're wow. getting that from people. I do it probably to the point where people are like, that's this is not awesome. Dan DMing me. I love it. I love it, man. It's a, hey, we That's got one, cool. one, you know, ticket on here unless reincarnation is possible. And <laughs> you're trying to grow in places that I fucked up and failed myself sometimes in life. I'd like to think I'm on the other side and not only that, but contributing to where that younger version of myself would be like, oh, I grew to be that guy. Oh, wow. And I think that's also bringing it fully back to stand up and bringing it back to integrity is like, we all need to be able to make our mistakes and sometimes say the wrong things or step in it. Because the truth is when you finally arrive at that moment where you quote, make it, you use everything. Hmm. You use Johnny Carson once said that you use everything. You use things that you did when you were seven years old. Hmm. You use emotional valves, you know, in your twenties, thirties, forties. And to be able to grow through that, keep your integrity, but know like, hey, I, I've stepped in it. I've, I've been a jerk off, but now I can talk both as a person who's succeeded and fucked up, and that makes you even more relatable and interesting. Yeah, and you you admit to a lot of mistakes you've made. Yes, that's 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 <laughs> a really good. Well, but that's a beautiful quality, <laughs> well, it buddy. It's makes huge. it interesting. I, yeah. I want to tell you when you admit to your mistakes. Yeah, it that is a workshop right. for everybody around you. You're helping yeah. them not right. to fall in the same trap. Yes. There is no perfect human. There isn't, and it also <laughs> it it gives you a little bit of. Uh, it gives you the liberty to, when you're excited about something, to maybe talk it up a little more. People give you the pass if they're like, well, he knows when he's, you know, <laughs> stepped in it. So you can boast a little bit more when you're like, all right, I got one, you know, I'm, I'm this one I'm excited about. And I think people are more accepting of that when they know that like, okay, it's not always the good days you talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's really pricey, yeah. especially in today's yeah. social media world. You, you share those with the world. Okay. So, um, you mentioned how wonderful your team was. What bad decisions they made for you that you can right off the bat oh, go, wow. ah, they pushed me to do that one and that was the worst oh, wow. thing I did. Uh, I passed on the proposal with Sandra Bullock and I remember them calling and being like, you want to give that another read? And I was like, nah, I'm good. And and then I remember like when it became what it did, I was like, why didn't you guys stay on me on that one? I didn't know it was that director. I didn't know it was that team. And it was one of those things where I remember just being like, yeah, they didn't, somebody there wasn't like, I'm seeing this is Sandra Bullock. She's, she's a winner. Like, and I think I had passed on it because I was like, oh no, I did two comedies in a row. And I, now I want to, I was starting to feel myself a little and go like, now I want to do another drama or a, a Dan in real life. Or, and so that was one that got away that with the team, I was like, oh, I wish that they had stepped mm -hmm. up and kind of, they weren't keeping their eye on everything at that point either, because you do hit that point in your, when you hit the upper echelon, you're just like, damn, when this goes through the clouds into some turbulence, it's going to be tricky. That's a career. Um, I, I keep a lot of irons in the fire into this day. And even then, because a lot of them are going to cool. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are going to mm -hmm. cool. I got 10 irons in the fire. And then a week later, you're like lost financing. That person quit. That person's place burnt down. Like, so you keep all those irons in the fire because the realization is, you know, and I know you can work, 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 and maybe nobody sees those sets. And the one night you're in there just working out and you don't really give a shit, somebody mm -hmm. at the back of the room is like, here's my card. I'm with so-and-so. And, -so and yep, it, all, yep. it all changes, yep. man. In an, in I, an I, saw, I saw one of those uh, during your career. I remember I was a young comic. Um, this random director and the producer, uh, I, was, I, was, I was in college at UCLA. And uh, this producer hits me up and goes, hey, uh, I'm directing this movie called London. And I'm taking a director to the Laugh Factory. He wants oh, to wow. see Dane and see how it goes. It's like, okay. So, you know, they saw you, they loved you. And the following weekend, uh, everybody came back and, and he brought the casting director. It was a big casting director. I, I was there. I forgot for her name. Mindy Mary? They, yeah. Was she, it Mindy? Yeah. She would never go out anywhere. So I She's remember uh, sitting with everybody. And you went on stage, you you performed, you knew they were upstairs, you came upstairs yep. to the green room. And I was sitting there and uh, I didn't say a word. I just, I just sat just there and, and I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at the end I said, Dane, uh, congrats, man, this is amazing. And you were like, you know, uh, she doesn't go anywhere. And the fact she just came to the show, that's everything. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you, uh, you booked that movie that night. And right. let me tell you- It was you, a Jessica Biel film. Only because- Evans. Yeah, and only because I was in the room. What happened is after you performed, Louis C.K. went up. Mm -hmm. 
And they didn't know who Louis C.K. was. Right. They came to see you. And when they saw Louis, they liked him. They gave him a role too. I didn't even know he was in that movie too. Yeah, London. Yeah. London, yeah. I didn't He's even know movie. he was in there. And, and I clearly remember, I was like, wow, they saw the other guy. Yeah. And they liked him. That's even cooler. And he guys like, give him a role. Like, they gave him a role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did so, not know that. Yeah, dude. Fun it was, facts. It was amazing. <laughs> I mean, I've seen so many, like, just really beautiful experiences at the it club. Just, it just shows a lot of good comes out of when you have a great set and you move people, directors, producers, they become fans yeah. at that moment. Cause that's all they want. They want somebody who's gonna be on the screen for them and make somebody feel something. And if you can tap into that, then you got a shot at having a very long career. Yeah. Yeah. So buddy, one thing about you for sure is a fact is the Facts. kid, the kid is alive in you yeah. at all times, <laughs> the whole time. Like you don't say all these years. Yeah. <laughs> All these years, buddy, you you just, you have this kid alive in you and, and you just, you know, and, and this is probably the most beautiful thing about you. Like you're ageless in the sense that you never, ever have a dull moment. You're not coming in, you're always <laughs> giddy. You're coming yeah. in, you know, with that excitement. How do you see yourself as a, as a 90 year old? What's Dane as an old man? Well, when I would see, um, this is one of my favorite stories. When I would see Jerry Lewis perform, you know, he was still performing in his late eighties. He, he was on tour his whole career, wow. you know, eight decades of comedy. Wow. And I go to his <clears throat> performance one night and I'd seen him a dozen times, you know, over a couple of year period. And, uh, they gave him the, he would do a Q and a for 40 minutes and they lit him at 20. And so his Q and a was quick. And he's backstage and Danielle, his daughter, who I'm so close with, she's an incredible human being. And I go back there and she's like, he doesn't want anybody near him but you. So you can go back there. And Jerry's sitting there by himself and he's kind of stewing. He's like a little surly looking. And he grabs me by the arm and he goes, they cut my fucking time. It was supposed to be 40. And he was so upset, <laughs> his whole career, everything he'd done, he wanted that extra time as a performer. Uh -huh. Why did they let me early? And I remember right in that moment being like, that's gonna be me. I love. I have a love of the game. Uh, I, I'm 32 years in and I feel just as, um, you know, effervescent and excited to perform as the first day. If I'm sick, if I'm having a rough day, whatever, when I'm walking towards that stage, I, I have a gratitude that washes over me, but it also reminds me of, I was the quietest kid who didn't feel like I had a voice, who didn't really have a lot of belief in myself. So every time I get to do it another time, I think it mm. just connects the whole damn life. And I don't look at myself, I'm, I'm this is gonna sound a little heady, when I'm on stage, you know, for the first 20 years, I never told anybody how old I was. I never said it. I wouldn't put it on the internet. Before you could find it on the internet, you didn't know how old I was. Because mm -hmm. I, I want to be ageless because I feel that way when I'm up there. So when I'm up there, I'm connected, like Johnny Carson said, to my whole life. I'm a kid, but I'm also a man who's been through a lot. So traumas and love and mm -hmm. breakups, and it's all happening yeah. right in that moment. Yeah. And our full-time job is to keep the kid alive. Yeah. That's our full-time yeah. job. If anybody knows that, that is you yeah. because your <laughs> eyes sparkle more yeah. when you're on stage. <laughs> you get up there. No, I'm serious, man, because you're in front of the stager. I always say that, you know, like the eye sparkles, it's important. It actually, <laughs> it's important in Broadway. It's important in a lot of, um, because a lot of performers, you might notice they, they, um, they don't play up and they don't let the lights hit their eyes and they play down or they skulk or they're in their head and they have an attitude. They might be kind of like, you know, thinking about something. But you step to the front of the stage and you open your eyes and you see the <laughs> shimmer and that's the childlike quality, man. Yeah, you know, my yeah. mom used to call it the sparkle. She'd say, baby, you got the sparkle. Yeah. And I think it's because it's like you get up there and you, <laughs> you keep that going. Keep yeah, your teeth white exactly. too. That adds some sparkle in there too. <laughs> I, that's, that's why I relate to you in so many ways. Just your energy. I relate yeah. to your energy. I relate to the excitement. Yeah. And, and But I forget sometimes you know. I'm 51. The other day I did that thing where I hit my foot goes on the back of the um, Laugh Factory stage. You know how there's like the lip that comes out this much and you kind of put your foot on it? <laughs> sometimes I jump off of it. I still do this thing. <laughs> sometimes I just, I'll, I'll be like, if it's a woohoo moment in a bit, I will literally launch myself <laughs> eight feet and land at the person in the front and be like, you know what I'm talking about. 
I did it the other night. I came down on my like my my patella tendon kind of like was like eek. So that's the only thing about getting a little older is you got to make sure you stretch out before you hit the stage. Oh my god, <laughs> this is the thing. I like really. I feel like you're never getting old, man. You're that guy oh, who's never gonna get you know Mick Jagger. Some some people just don't get old. You well, know? you know, I'm glad that you mentioned that Mick Jagger was on the Grammys. If I'm gonna sing you this link later, I don't know if you've seen this or have I seen you this link? The Mick Jagger at the Grammy link about eight years ago. No. He's 73, I think, at the time. And he's doing a blues tribute, and they bring him out, and he gets up there, and he's singing that song, goes, uh, dun 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 I want you, you, you. I think the Blues Brothers covered it, yep. right? Mick Jagger comes out. Now, Mick Jagger is royalty. Mick yeah. Jagger and the Rolling Stones are... Hall of Famers, and if God forbid the Hall of Fame burns down, when you build the new building, the first day, get the Rolling Stone exhibit up. That's Rolling Stones. That's right. He could sit on a stool and go, I want you, 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 woo. And you're like, that's Mick Jagger. He's 70 something. He can sit on the stool. He's going to rock it. Respect. <sighs> this dude came out. When I sing you this link, you're going to, you might get emotional. Wow. And you, and you, like me, it's on my browser. I watch it once a month for eight years. Wow. Once a month. I, I see it. I'm watching it right now. And I watch it. And he comes out. And the song is up-tempo. He starts running. And he's bumping into the guitar. It's not just like the fun little, hey, you're playing. Like, he's pushing the guitar. And, the, and then he runs down to the front. And he, I want you, you, you. And he's pointing. Wow. And they cut to crowd shots and Drake is like this, like wow. not just, I'm not just, I'm watching you. Everybody's like, he Rocking owns like the that. room and he's making us all look like amateur hour because that's a fucking performer. That's a showman. And that's somebody who loves it so much that he's not. Hey, I'm going to do 80% tonight because I'm Mick Jagger. Put the spotlight mm -hmm. on me. I'll look nice. I'll sit in a fucking Armani chair. He's sweating. His hair's all tussled up. And when he leaves and hits those last few notes and the place is already on their feet, there's no need for a standing ovation, but they got, they got taller. I send you this and I watch, and you yeah, watch that. I would love that. And you what, would go. What an inspiration. Oh man, come on, man. What That's an it. For us, it means mm. so much to, to see that, you know, I'm always going to be a performer at the best I can be. It, it, at 73, he gave 300%. And I will tell you, I'm not a starstruck person. We've met a lot of people. We see a lot of people. I'll admit something right now. He was at a party that I was at three years ago. He's the only person that as he was passing by me, I didn't know how to react. And I touched him like a fan. I wow. literally like my, I let my arm touch him, but I didn't even have the ability to say, hmm. it's never happened. I, I've met a lot of people. And usually I, I'm cool. Dude, I that, love that. That was unbelievable. I just oh, wanted to go uh, like brush past him and be like, <laughs> yeah, that was Mick Jagger, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, the best. Thanks for sharing it the way you do, man. The Thanks, way buddy. you fucking explain oh, shit. Yeah. I love. <laughs> buddy, um, first of all, I can speak to you for hours. And you know that because we always do. We sit down and we just talk about something for a long time. And, and you're so good at telling stories. But I, I before we wrap up, I want to talk about something and I, I want to share a few things again. Um, you know, we, we were in the company of such amazing comedians in, in, right. in LA and, and around the world, we meet amazing people, right. but, uh, everyone brings something very unique to the table. Mm -hmm. And, and you've always been the guy who shared a lot. It's just you. You are so open. You open your heart and you're good at it. And you put it in such beautiful words. You have a way with, you know, telling stories, the <laughs> vocabulary you use, just the way Dane <laughs> right. tells his thing is yeah, special. I'm into it. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you shared some of your hardest uh, life experiences. Right. And when your parents uh, had that tragic uh, death and you opened it up to the world, and, and you really not only shared, but you, you explained the history, the background, the connections. And yeah. dude, I just want to tell you, we all learned so much. Just mm -hmm. learned by, by your behavior we learned, by Thanks, what, what you're going through, everything. Uh, that would make my parents very proud. 
So yeah, thank you they they were very that. special. The and, best. and simply, yeah. you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. of of you sitting here oh, and yeah. they brought, you know, a, a kid mm. to the world and and they taught you what they taught you and with the ups and downs in your life, you you're yeah. you're a stand-up guy moving, you know, moving the needle forward and that's amazing. Oh, well, I live my life trying to make him proud. But yeah. I want to say this personally. Yeah. Um, when I lost my father, I thought of you so much and, and I, and you reached out to me and, and, sure. and I spoke to you and you said, Max, I'm here, anything you need. And, and it meant so much to me, but I, at that moment, <laughs> I wanted to, to, I want you to know that I felt like Dane, I've already gotten so much from you in this department. Like you've helped me so much already by everything you shared. Mm -hmm. To, to how and how I feel and how I want to share now. Right. So it was it was really special for me. And every year, you know, for their anniversary, you go out of your way, you sit down, you put in the time, you really, really do a great job at, at you know, letting it, the whole world in and to, right. to, to feel an experience. Yeah. So uh, I want to, first of all, thank you for that. Ah. Second of <laughs> all, ask you, um, where is the... Um, the the motivation comes to you to say i'm going to do this for people and i'm going to let them in i don't like thinking of people feeling alone and lonely you know it just harkens back to sometimes how i felt as a kid and even though i have those great parents you know it is a solo journey this life mm -hmm. in a lot of ways you know even with you can be in a crowded room and feel very alone and you can be in isolation and feel like you've got all your dreams you know pistons popping and all the enthusiasm and excitement um, I think with my, my parents and why I want to share that is because the empathy that I gained from that, that I didn't have or, or understand before that. Um, and you don't until you've been through it. Um, it's a unique club that we enter into, especially as young men, when we lose our dad, you know, we mm -hmm. need that uh, positive male reinforcement. And even though my mom is in my heart and my mom was my compass, um, when your dad passed away, you know, in, in realizing that everything you are is from pretty much everything that he did right and wrong mm. and how he behaved from being right or wrong, even more important, not even being right or wrong. How did they react to their own discretions or indiscretions or discretions, <laughs> shuns. Um, and so with, with me to share that, I always like to, um, I don't read a lot of comments anymore. I probably stopped reading comments a long time ago and we know why it's pretty toxic and it has nothing to do with you. What other people think of you has nothing to do with you. Mm -hmm. Um, but those comments I read when I post about my parents, because some people will say, I really needed to hear that because I'm going through A, B, and C. I like to DM people sometimes. That's a great way to like, throw a line out there and say, Hey man, I caught your comment. And then they get excited. Like, Oh my God, I can't believe you're writing me. And after that wears off of like, Oh, the comedian that I like wrote me, you get into a real heart to heart with somebody. Mm -hmm. I think some of the greatest conversations that you can have in this world is with a stranger that you're only connecting on what started that conversation. It's very beautiful. Yes. Uh, we I lose agree. a lot of that with the internet, but I, I gain yeah. it when I post those pictures. I, I so agree that you feel like they need it. Someone out there needs to hear this. Right. You really. And I need to express it. So it's very, very, um, it's an equal playing field in that, that yeah. regard, yeah. you know? And I love talking about my parents. Yeah. I love it. You That's know, it, it, in, in the documentary, which I'm not, I can't talk about too much, but I can't say I'm shooting this documentary that, um, talks a lot about different aspects of my life, but to talk up my parents and to be able to really communicate the immense love, mm that they instilled in me as a person and performer, that's probably one of my crowning achievements is being able to show George and Donna in that light. Oh. Yeah. Were you the favorite kid? I think I kept them the most kind of like spun up. And so <laughs> you know I think the... the attention to detail with me was probably a little bit, you know, yes, yes, I made yes. it rougher on them. So they, I got more time spent. <laughs> <laughs> you were the favorite kid. Okay. That's beautiful. Hmm. Yeah, I really share that in common with you. I have so much love for my parents. Yeah. I feel like I owe uh, everything to to them. Yeah, um, both of them played a big role in my life, right? And in my career, 
And I feel like uh, at the end of the day, we come to this planet Earth to serve, to give back to the to the world, give back to people. Right. And and you and I have this journey in the entertainment world. Yeah. We make people laugh. We tell stories that people cry. We we really take people on our journey and and do something positive. Right. And, Can I ask you a question? Do you mind if I yeah, ask you a please. question about your when you're on stage? Is there a part of your dad that you feel like is kind of the most present or indicative of what you either took from him physically or reactionary or uh, verbally? Is there a part of your dad that you're like, ah, oh, that you can hear yourself and be like, that's my dad? Yeah. Do yeah. you mind if I yeah, like- Absolutely, I'll tell you. Okay. Anytime I say something that has a good meaning to it, if I do, if I say something that it's like um, educational for the audience, right. if it's spiritual, that's that's my dad. It's almost like when you enter into a slight bit of commentary on the very thing you're talking about, yep. Yep. being able to be succinct and explain it yep. is yep. like, it's both an homage, but it is your father yeah. and what he gave to you. Because that's a really great thing. Always, and I'll, I'll look for that now. I get to see oh, that. Yeah, yeah. And I tell you, he <laughs> always tells me, Max, uh, you're so funny. You're doing so good. Try to add some more uh, spirituality into it. And he was he loved this whole world of of spirituality and, right. and 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 he was like you know do something that people can you know talk about something people can learn from. And I remember I was so young, I'm like dad, I'm just trying to get a laugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying. I'm trying to make a <laughs> How joke. Can we I, learn I from I a know, vagina joke you know? <laughs> that dovetails into. <laughs> you know? But but you know after he passed, you know, and my age, life experience allowed me to find my premises uh, and, and set the premise right. um, in a way that, that, that tells people that there's, a, there's, a, there's another meaning behind this. There is a lot here to right. unfold. And then I would go into the joke. So I talk about, you know, when I do my shows on the road and I play theaters, I talk about mixed marriages. So I talk about how wonderful it is to, to meet people from other ethnicities. Love doesn't understand religion, color, background. You right. just, you got to find someone that you connect with. Right. Then I go into the joke about my uncle and my aunt. My uncle's Persian. My aunt's, you know, Bolivian. Yeah. And, and, and so it's very personal I at that push point. for those moments to feel like what my father really um, left for me was yeah. this, he impacted me in a way to right, do right. good for the world. Say something that people can leave the theater and go, wow, we learned something. Right. Nowadays, it's it's a lot more so in my act, mm. you know? And, and I hope uh, actually soon when my next LA big theater show comes up, yeah. I can invite you because you've never seen me play the whole hour and a half. Well, I've never also seen you play that size venue. And it's yeah. very different from when we're yeah, performing completely. at a club. It, we're yeah. working. Even yeah. if it's a hot night and you're doing great, it's still a fragment of the show. Yeah. So I'd I, like I that. press record at the Laugh Factory. Yeah. And I promise myself to just rely on my subconscious because I come up with so much material. Yeah just doing that yeah. and I go and I go and I go and I push for it honestly right. sometimes I'm like I want to fall back on a, on a bit here but yeah. I'm like just stick with it yeah yeah you yeah. know and and it's <laughs> and it's been a gift in the sense that I've been using it as an opportunity right. to to come up with material for the road oh it's working yeah. whatever that yeah. system is your, your mechanics you know you you make it look easy <laughs> well yeah. I'll tell you like with me like my my swagger and the attitude is my dad and the mm. animation and the silliness the lightheartedness is my mom. You know, she was very physical and very, uh, she wasn't afraid to kind of be a little bit of a cut up and, you know, kind of make fun of herself. And my dad had the, like a no bullshit attitude. Mm -hmm. And he was also an athlete. So when he would play baseball or boxing or whatever, he came into the ring with like, I got it. Wow. He was that guy. He was kind of, a, he, my dad had a scary uh, uh, affect or something. Like he, there was something about my dad. He was a, he was a, sweetheart but he had a he had a <laughs> he thing intimidate you huh? and so yeah he had a thing a lot of guys told me even after he passed me he's like you know your dad passed away and i'm still kind of scared of him <laughs> <laughs> george just had that thing and so i i took both of those and took their acts and kind of said like the the attitude and the um the athleticism and treating it like you know i'm up at bat you know looking at the you know i want to hit a home run right there kind of thing looking up at the i always look up at the top but then the silliness and the free, the free like uh, fluidity and movement is so my mom. So it's nice to be able to talk about that. And I think people will like that to know like, oh, now we get to know your family a little more while you're performing. Yeah. I think it's really cool. 
Buddy, this is so sweet. Thanks for sharing. Is there anything you want to leave out there before we wrap it up? It's probably just, uh, you know, my new tour that I'm on this October, November is the Perfectly Shattered Tour. And people have been asking me, like, what's the title? What What is the Perfectly Shattered Tour? And for me, it's the understanding that perfectly shattered means all the things that we feel like are breakdown moments, mm -hmm. fall apart moments, or we feel like we're in pieces. All of those uh, particles and parts, they equal beauty. They equal exactly where you're supposed to be. And that's true in comedy. So mm -hmm. perfectly shattered is like the show I'm delivering is a result of all the, the good and a lot of those you know, breakdown moments to bring you a show that is more present than last year or the year before or the year before. So October, November, danecook.com for all my tour okay. dates. Dope title. I can't wait to, to yes. actually hear the, the material. Buddy, uh, we, ha we have a lot to cover. Yeah. So yeah. once in a while, we should do this. Okay. Sit yeah. down. I mean, this was just a real, for me, was just a joy to share yeah. with people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is what you know, we would my, do in my the- My friendship with you, my, yeah. my conversations, my memories. What and, we would do at the club. Just yeah, shoot the gip yeah, and absolutely. just enjoy each other's company, you know? Buddy, thank you. Much love. You got it, brother.